personally pretty passionate about it. From track from my existing exports, including data go you, uh, data ACT, um, and generally uh, try and get more and more people working up their government data. This is um, a little initiative that you may have heard of, like GovPack. Um, and so open data and, and data publishing, better data driven decision making across you know, everywhere, and in particular in government, is certainly something I'm really passionate about. Um, but I think we need to also think bigger. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. But let me start with kind of where we're at in Australia. Um, five years ago, even two years ago, uh, open data was something that a lot of us were really fighting to try to get a little bit on the agenda, and there really wasn't a lot out there. Um, there was certainly data published by some agencies very well. Um, there was a little bit of data you know, from some companies out there. There's you know, been uh, little pockets that have done some really great stuff, but not a lot, and there certainly wasn't a lot of connection. And for me, where this stuff gets powerful is when you start getting um, cross-disciplinary approach to knowledge and to information, uh, where you get your, your geeks in the room with your scientists in the room with your designers in the room with, you know, um, the game developers or some of the I guess one of the underutilized resources that we have. Um, and, and you get those people in a room to look at a problem in a really interesting way. Um, What's happened in the last couple of years is we've hit a bit of a tipping point with open data in Australia where everyone broadly agrees it's a good idea. Now, as weird as it sounds, that's a really good step. Um, now it's been about, and the tipping point was data.gov.au, which, you know, when I picked it up, has 1,200 data sets, of which a third were broken, a third were duplicated from elsewhere, so we're you know, really on 400 useful data sets that were out of band anyway. We picked it up, relaunched it, and it's now got 6,600 data sets, and it's um, actually integrated with one of the state data portals and being it's increasingly integrated with all the data portals in Australia once the people access them. The tipping point for us, apart from having much better technology stack, because that's important, super important, um, the tipping point for us was getting government agencies to understand what's in it for them. Because public good and um, you know, uh, what it can do from a community perspective, from an economic perspective, Everyone agrees with that broadly, but it's hard to allocate resources when you're also cutting the number of people, cutting a bad budget, all that kind of stuff, right? But when you can show, actually, it'll save you money to do this. It'll save you uh, your freedom of information request by putting out data that you regularly ask for. It's a regular open thing. It'll save you money when you're trying to do your, you know, the apps that every, all your ministers want to see uh, by putting the data out so you can build your own applications and web um, sort of tools to talk to your data in more efficient ways. So you can share data across agencies efficiently than just to set up the highly bureaucratic process of setting up an MOU. I don't think if any of you have had to do that in any form. So open data has become, the reason we've been able to be quite successful with data data use has been because we've turned it around and sort of made it about, we know that all those great public benefits will happen if it happens properly, but it's only going to happen properly if people see it to be in their best interest, which we've been able to start to do, which is quite exciting. Um, and, and we're getting some big, you know, useful, interesting data sets being published now, not just, you know, a couple of little spreadsheets here or there or PDFs here or there or whatever. So, so we've made a lot of progress and there are a lot of people even here in the room that are responsible for that, for that um, um, outcome and it's been really, really good. Um, I, I guess where I want to go is, is to that next step, but I should make very clear, I'm not here representing the government, I happen to work in government, a lot of people, a lot of people in government now pushing this very exciting and I, I feel like there is actually a little army of disruptors, again, a few of you are in the room, that are um, busily making government a better place for everyone, usually for no thanks and usually you know, maybe use it every turn, but that's all right, because uh, we know we're making the world a better place. Um, but, so, so the big picture, how many people here have um, been to university? All right, so I'm right now doing some study, trying to get access to academic publications Aaron Schwartz is really onto it. Um, and um, so, I mean, there, there are so many examples where knowledge is locked up, where we are just putting huge gates around really critical pieces of, you know, our human learning. Um, there's a thing called collective learning, which is a concept that humans, way back, I think I told you, I'm studying at the moment, amusingly enough, way back since we first, you know, before we, we were kind of sapiens back in the hominoids sort of uh, level. Um, it was the idea that two people could actually share even basic language, you know, basic symbolic language, to be able to share information quickly. 
and to, to be able to then grow in that knowledge and then to be able to pass knowledge on from generation to generation, pass knowledge on from community to community. The advent of you know, better language, the invention of, of the internet, these things have all dramatically increased collective learning because we can share knowledge so much more rapidly across communities, across expertise, across disciplines, and all those things. But then we <coughs> have, then we take our most important asset, information, which has driven, you know, tens of millennia, <laughs> hundreds of millennia, um, of evolution, and we're shutting it down, which is kind of stupid when you think about it. So, from my perspective, open knowledge is understanding the very important role that data plays, but then getting beyond that. When I was working up at Parliament House, one of the little um, uh, campaigns that I took on as a personal thing was they um, was to try to liberate the Magna Carta. Now, the Magna Carta, we have one of the best preserved copies of the Magna Carta in Australia, in the world, right? Uh, we, I think we were gifted it, or we paid it for the money, I think we were gifted it, yeah. So we were given one of the best preserved um, original copies of the Magna Carta. And it sits up at Parliament House, and it's, you have to walk in and you see it, right? So that's cool. Um, then they digitized it. So we said, cool, you have a digitized version of the Magna Carta. We thought we'd have high-res versions, which is what I did from the office I was in, I caused a lot of pain. Um, so we thought we'd have high-res versions when we were creating Commons license so we can distribute it. Oh, oh no, <laughs> we'll give you a high-res version under a Crown copyright license. Creative Commons license. Ah, uh, we'll give you a low-res version of the Creative Commons. No. <laughs> and, and we got into this argument. And for me, it was a real turning point in my understanding about human nature and about some of the blockers for open knowledge we have in society. Because we got to this point where this woman, who was very passionate from the other side of the fence, we got to this point where we both said the same thing to each other, but it had completely, fundamentally different meaning. She said to me, but it's the Magna Carta. And I said, <laughs> yeah, it's the Magna Carta. <laughs> So I'm, because of course I'm coming from the perspective, it's, it's out of copyright, one would argue. Um, <laughs> but also from the perspective, it's such an important document, it should be liberated, it should be freely accessible, it should be available for us and the whole society, of course the whole world to be able to use. She of course is coming from the perspective which I respect, and I came to understand it in that conversation, of because it's the Magna Carta, we have to protect it, we have to stop people to file it, we have to make sure it can't be, you know, abused or graffiti and all this kind of stuff. And frankly, that's part of the freedom of um, but we came to this common understanding and the, the thing that cut through that conversation was when I said, but don't you want your beautiful version of the Magna Carta to be the defining version of the Magna Carta globally? Don't you want to be the authoritative source for the Magna Carta? She had to go away and think about that one. Um, where I'm going at though is we, we've, we've introduced a culture of shutting down knowledge and we've created a rationalization, a system of rationalizations around why we do that. Some people think it's for protection, some people think it's about integrity, some people think it's about you know, um, protecting stuff from that rabble rousers out there that like to do weird stuff like we do with Um but, but getting to that perspective that knowledge is something that is critical to our evolution as a species isn't usually on the, in, in the conversation, so and I think that we can turn that around a little bit. So let me talk to you about where I think this is going and where I think uh, where I hope it goes, governance. I've been long involved in all things open, uh, open source and data and knowledge and um, opening up the beer. <laughs> um, but um, I, and, and the funny thing is I've seen data and open source really um, start to take off and become you know better adopted in governments, better understood by governments. Still got a way to go but it's it's rapidly changing and that's very exciting. Where I think we need to go is the concept of governance as an API, which is something I like to talk about a lot. Now, government as a platform is this concept that's been around for a while. If you haven't checked it out, check out some of the works and discussions about government as a platform. It's been around for a while. But how that's been interpreted in practice has largely been about we have some shared platforms. Okay? We create one platform, multiple agents can use it, we can all save time and money. Yeah. Um, sometimes they go so far as about shared standards and about you know, taking more standards, technical, data-driven kind of approach to that. But shared platforms are still just shared platforms, right? And usually it's about still just having shared platforms to support you know, uh, a, an end goal, whether it's a report or a service or a website or whatever. Where I think we need to get to is governance and API, where we make everything the government does, everything, apart from where there is a legitimate reason otherwise, everything discoverable through an API, consumable through an API, and then you start to really get crap out of business. Um, and everything to be mashable, so that then we can start to have what government does well, government should continue to do, particularly in an egalitarian country like Australia, where we expect the government to give us free healthcare, free schooling, you know, the things that we expect in a country like Australia, government 
should, I believe, continue to do. Um, but um, but it should do it in a way that the, the front line of that can actually be retail, that can be mashed together. People can better solve their own problems, they can build them on the platform the government has to run by default, which goes very much to the point that Cynthia was talking about, just about being able to better leverage the assets that we have and that we have to create naturally for the benefit of the broader um, public good, public benefit. So for me, what does that mean? It, it's about opening up government content, so all government website content, publications, information, data, and information about services, so let's start with the content, all of it should be discoverable and consumable. If you want to set up a website to help your community, you want to be able to mash up what are the services that apply to this community, what are the, what's the content that's relevant, where can I consume this stuff from, and I want to, you know, I want to make a great service, why can't I build on the back of government to do that? Then we get into the consumption aspect of services, so open services. So we have a few services in government now where you can actually interface with the back end transaction system. You don't have to, you know, go through the government website or the government application. You can actually talk directly to the backend system through an authenticated API, and it just works, and it's awesome. Some of those APIs are better written than others, but um, there are already models for the wholesaling of government services today. So, and being able to better leverage data services and content across all the government also means that we don't end up in that awful world that we're in today, where when you, when you interact with government, I interact with government because you know, public servants and citizens too, people can come together. Um, we have this experience of, okay, I go to this website and I can't find what I need, go to some other website. We're forced to understand the complexity of government in order to interact with it. We shouldn't have to. If everything that government agencies individually did was able to be mashed up, then we can actually obscure the complexity of government, which changes every couple of years anyway, right? And we can make it easier to um, interact with um, government in any sort of way that's useful to people. Um, and I guess the final part of that is, is the idea of then, then you would have all of these things API enabled in ways that can be consumed, can be used, can be mashed up. And also starting to get closer towards this concept of open community. How does government collaborate with community? How does community collaborate with government? How does private sector collaborate? We've got these, these very traditional, very old, very outdated modes of collaboration or, or you know, partnership, which are based on a, you know, a pre-internet age. There are so much more interesting ways we can do things, which is part of the reason that uh, myself and, a, and a, you know, a relatively small first bunch of very dedicated volunteers kicked off GovHack. Because, you know, we do it, we run it in our spare time. It is incredibly successful. And the reason it's been so successful is because people want to do cool stuff. Government wants to do cool stuff. Um, you know, citizens want to do cool stuff. Industry wants to do cool stuff. And quite often we don't have a place to play. Or, you, can, you know, you have to set up this scope of work. You have to have a definition of what outcomes you're going to have to have, you're going to have to have a definition of how you're going to spend money. It's very, very complicated. Um, GovHack has been this wonderful journey of how, you know, this new model of public engagement and public partnership. So I'd like to encourage you all to think beyond data, think about government and API, and if these sort of things were available in API, how would you use it? How would you you know, serve it? How would you want it? Um, but also to think about open community. So we have a wonderful community in Australia. Another reason that we set up GovHack was Australia has one of the best tech communities in the world. And I know I've been to a lot of countries um, and interacted with a lot of communities. Um, we have a great technical community. We just get up and do it ourselves. You know, we, we get up and do stuff ourselves. We work across different um, disciplines. And frankly, if someone tells us we can't do something, that's usually a motivation to do something. The Australian, you know, um, underdog, um, mentality is a, is a wonderful <laughs> mechanism to get things done. Um, and a few of you know when people try to tell me not to do something, how that works out. Um, but that, that sense of open community, how can I collaborate with other people? And, and on the Open Knowledge Australia website, even now, there, you know, there's already a community that's growing of journalists, data people, science people, uh, civic hacking, um, budget people. You know, there's already a, a wonderful a space for a wonderful growing community in Australia that, that plays in this space. Um, that's about all of it. No, we have a question at the end. Yes? Okay, thank you very much.